little situation I know I've faced, sort of a stereotype that sometimes women face is related to childcare. So I have two kids and I know I remember when I had my daughter and um, I was uh, just finishing my maternity leave. So I took a year off to spend time with her when she was a baby. And I remember talking about going back to work, returning after my one year off and having a few people sort of comment on, in a bit of a judgmental way, the idea of, you know, a mom going back to work and just sort of some, you know, not so helpful comments about that and how it was a bit hurtful because I had made that decision for myself and my family to go back to work. Um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be something other people should comment on. So while sometimes comments like that can be hard, um, I found that just focusing on myself and my family um, and our needs that I was able to kind of make the decision that was best for us. And that I think um, all women and, and parents should be able to make those kind of decisions that work for them. Uh, I just wanted to talk about International Women's Day. Uh, I have faced adversity a few times. Um, I started out playing sports when I was quite young and I decided I wanted to play rugby. And in school, uh, the boys would say, no, girls can't play rugby. The teachers said, no, girls can't play rugby. And there was no team for us to play on. So um, back in grade 10, I decided, no, nope, this is what I wanna do. I want to play rugby. I don't care if it's a boy's sport. So I started a rugby program at Heritage Park in Mission with my mom. And the program is actually still going. Um, I ended up going on to play for the Fraser Valley. I played for uh, BC and Canada playing rugby so and I'm still playing today and even now after playing for probably 15 years I still find that there's moments when people when they hear I play rugby they're like that's not what girls do and I just want everybody to know that you can do whatever you want to do you know I I would like to start off by saying that um, I'm not that old but um, I I can think of situations that I have encountered that um, like you might think happened like back in like the 50s or the 60s. Uh, when I was in university, I had an internship at the Medical Research Council of Canada and uh, I was there doing research and uh, um, the director at the time uh, came, to buy, came by my desk at one point and he said, um, he just says to me, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a muffin and a coffee and uh, and I, I didn't like. I didn't actually understand what was going on. And I, like, I looked at some of the other interns, and they were, they're like, I think, I think he's expecting that you'll go get him a muffin and a coffee. And uh, it, um, yeah. And I was totally taken aback. And I was like, well, is, like, is he going to give me any money? And no, like his expectation, like he. He saw a woman in the office and he just thought that this woman in the office was going to go and get him his lunch and his coffee and his snack and uh and you know now i'm i'm a mom and i i have a six-year-old boy and um just in the last two weeks um he has said things to me like pink shirt day and he has said things to me like um mommy only girls wear pink and girls cry and and boys don't cry and, um, and it shocks me because you know those are messages that he is not hearing at home um, you know so for me and from my husband like he's hearing like nobody boys and girls wear pink anybody wears pink no it's it's okay to cry no anybody can be good at anything and uh, we we want we want our girls to hear a different message and our boys for that matter and i have definitely experienced i guess prejudice and discrimination for being a woman but not just a woman but a woman a minority so right. 
growing up, I just remember hearing all the time, it, it was always an issue. It was boys were in science, and we're talking in the 70s and 80s here, so I'm aging myself there. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, boys were in science all the time. And so I remember I loved science. I was definitely science driven, but there weren't very many opportunities. And so finally, there was an opportunity where it was, there was a conference I went to. It was about women or young ladies in science. Uh, and I had an opportunity to participate in that. And if it wasn't for that, uh, I probably wouldn't have gotten my degree in science and pursued a career, believe it or not. It was science-based, even though it's in, in education. So that was, there came a time where it was being a woman and being a woman of color, that there was some adversity for me. Um, finding a job uh, when I was a student in school, often, um, and this is more maybe related to discrimination in terms of racism, um, but if they saw my name, Soraya Rajabali, there was a certain level of discrimination, and so I wasn't getting the interviews. Um, a lot of my male friends, in fact, who were the ones getting the interviews, which was really shocking to me because I'm like, I had better credentials than them, but I was a female and a female of a minority, right? So now, um, kind of broken a bit of a glass ceiling and you'll see that with some of my female admin team um, being an administrator in almost any school district they're mostly men we got male principals male vice principals um, usually the females are the teachers and so I'm really proud now that some of those barriers are coming down and there's such a loud voice now coming from the female or the, the um, women in terms of this profession and I'm really proud of being part of that so for me, my example is um, a little bit about breaking the glass ceiling. For many, many years, um, there was uh, clearly a belief that women could run a big building, a big school with a big budget, with lots of staff, um, etc. And so I am proud to be one of the first female principals in the district at the secondary level, and um, certainly breaking through the glass ceiling and encouraging my fellow um, peers females to never um, underestimate their ability to handle the big jobs and be able to navigate it with success and character and kindness. Many times I was told, you're going to cry, you're not going to be able to handle a pressure incident, you're not going to be able to deal with um, different scenarios that would come up and I can tell you to this day that I have faced each and every one of them um, with as much courage as I have, and I haven't cried, so that's my thing. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about was, I'm gonna read you a quote, it's from Dr. Jane Goodall, who um, is a world famous um, scientist, and she worked a lot with wildlife and spent a lot of her time with apes and monkeys in the population. Anyways, uh, one of the quotes that uh, she says, it says, it actually doesn't take much to be considered a difficult woman. That's why there are so many of us. So from a very young age, I was um, a bit of a difficult child, difficult teenager, difficult young woman, um, and I still sometimes get told, you know, why are you being so difficult? Even now, I'm kind of like breaking the rules and I'm not really answering the question, I'm putting my twist on it. Um, and I think sometimes that um, gives people a different impression of me and sometimes um, that changes the way people think about me, like I'm not easy to get along with or um, I don't follow the rules, I don't stay in line. Um, and so that idea of being a difficult woman is actually something that empowers me. Um, my mom was also a very difficult woman, and so was my grandmother, and so was my stepmom. So um, I come from a long line of very proud, difficult women. So to say that uh, being difficult is actually meaning that you're asking good questions, you're standing up for yourself, and you're demanding uh, the same things that you want for your friends and yourself. So. My story. So for five years, I coached. Um, in the college basketball league that's known as the Pac West here in British Columbia and I was the only female coach in a league of 10 different teams and so every week I was up against male um, peers who were coaching women's teams and I found it really hard to always be compared to men in the same role and also found that I was treated differently when I would um, interact with players or referees in the same ways that men did. I was expected to be quiet or to be a little bit more gentle and sweet and smiley and I found that really frustrating. Um, over the course of my years of coaching there um, I was able to make relationships with some of the other coaches and, and really talk about these kinds of things and raise awareness for women um, in sports and then um, in my last year of coaching I was um, 
selected by my peers, these male coaches, as the PacWest Coach of the Year. So that felt like a really tremendous accomplishment that a group of my peers who were men recognized me as being as capable and as effective at coaching uh, college basketball as they were. So that was, that was really uh, powerful for me as a woman coaching college sports.